Hi everyone, and welcome to season two of the Becoming Women podcast with me, your host, Ella Sims. My mission with this podcast is to support teenage girls as they navigate the ups and downs of growing up. Each week, I will be speaking with a new female interviewee and asking them what they learned during their teenage years. This season, I will be bringing you female specialists in well-being, mindfulness, authors, and young female activists. By speaking with both professionals and inspiring independent women, each individual episode provides you with confidence, tools to handle any challenges you may face, and the reassurance that you are not alone and those tricky teenage years will pass. On this week's episode, I'm with the lovely Natalie Costa. Natalie is the founder of Power Thoughts, a teaching, coaching and mindfulness service she created to give children the power over their own thoughts. With a background in psychology and having spent 12 years within the educational sector, as well as becoming an accredited performance coach, Power Thoughts was born, which blends her past experience and deep understanding of children and their needs now providing them with the tools to help them cope and thrive in the modern world. Supporting children from as young as five, Natalie has delivered Power Thoughts to over 3,000 children within schools and online. She has also been featured in the national press and TV such as Stella Magazine, The Telegraph, Metro, Glamour Magazine and Good Morning Britain. Her programmes are designed to help children recognise that they don't have to respond to every thought that they think, or react to everything that they feel. By doing this, they are able to grow in confidence, feel happier, and be more robust in dealing with the pressures of school, exams, transitioning, making friends, etc. Natalie's intention is always to be focused on helping one child at a time to be as happy as they can be. I really hope you enjoy listening to Natalie. She's so passionate about helping young children and her energy is infectious. Hi, Natalie, and welcome to the Becoming Women podcast. Hi, hello. How are you? So glad to finally, finally meet you. (laughs) (laughs) Over the internet. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to ask, your day-to-day job is all about empowering young people or young children from the age of five about the power of their minds. And you bring a really brilliant energy to that as well. How could... um, a young teenage girl use those tools that you share with children? Yeah, I think one of the key things that I teach children and young people is not to believe every thought that you think, to begin to gain awareness of the self-talk and the chatter and all of the thoughts that are swimming around our mind every single day. And I think that's one of the key things initially because so often, you know, we think anything between 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day, but so many of those thoughts are the same thoughts or it's the same habitual thoughts that we have. And so many of them can sometimes, you know, we can create these limiting stories for ourselves and we have this perception of what we can and what we can't do. And I think it's just about giving children and young people the power ultimately to begin to recognize some of those unhelpful stories that they're telling themselves that don't make them feel very good about themselves and perhaps disempower them and giving them the opportunity and the tools to rewrite some of those stories so that they can challenge those beliefs, step out of their comfort zone, whatever that might look like, and ultimately build their confidence and um, also, you know, the word resilience, but build that muscle of resilience to deal with the challenges and the setbacks that all of us are going to face, but in a healthier way and one that ultimately equips them to to bounce back that bit quicker. And what do you often find that young children struggle with in particular? Um, Oh, range of things. So definitely making mistakes um, is a big thing. So when I first put Power Thoughts together, 
I did a survey because I was still a primary school teacher at the time, and so I did a survey of the all, you know all of the children in our in our school. I think there were about four hundred children, and one of the top things that came up was I'm afraid of making mistakes or I'm not as good as my friend because you know I'm in the bottom set or whatever it might be. So there's real fear of getting things wrong, of not getting things right, is a big thing that I see, and obviously in tied in with that would be feelings of worry, feelings of overwhelm. Um, don't like to use the word anxiety because I think sometimes it it can be used quite quite lightly, but children would tell me I feel anxious. And of course, you know, let's validate the feeling, but it doesn't mean I now have anxiety. Um, and I think just beginning, you know, a lot of that would be tied into the fear of making mistakes. And ultimately, if you have to peel it completely back it goes back to the thing of I feel that I'm not good enough in whatever it is so I think but it masks its way a lot I think in terms of academics and school when it comes to mistakes and getting things wrong Mm. and what tools do you give them to begin with to help assist them with that yeah, so we, I mean, really young down, we'll start to explore the brain and look at what's happening inside your brain when you make mistakes, when you get things wrong, when things are difficult. So comparing the brain to a muscle and that the only way for this muscle to get stronger is to actually work through those challenges and to those mistakes that we made actually start to shift them into what I call yes moments so where we literally celebrate the fact that we've made a mistake and it's quite funny once children get this they really you know especially little children um you know they're the best because they love role play and they jump up and they'd be like yes and then have like a little party like a little dance party but then it's obviously right this is the mistake I've made what have I learned from it? And that is your yes moment. So keeping that running record of the mistakes, but what has helped me learn. And I think with older one, you know, with older pupils and young people I work with, it's about re tapping into that shift of perspective of beginning to look at things in a different way. Um, what have I learned from this? How will this help me grow? How is this a good thing? You know, what is good about this? It helps to get our brains out of that fight or flight or panic mode and not looking for solutions into opening it up again to start looking for solutions and identifying one next step that they can take. Yeah. And what happens if they've got those tools and they're using them, but then, you know, they have a setback or something happens and they weren't prepared for it? What what could they do? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, first of all, acknowledge the feelings. And I was talking to somebody about this the other day in terms of the disappointment or the worry or that anxiety feeling, you know, that anxiousness, that panic that might come up is acknowledge that feeling. And it's OK to feel that. Or if you're feeling angry, it's OK to feel that and give yourself, I think, it's really important to give yourself some time and some space to feel those feelings and to process them Um, because a feeling is just energy and motion in the body and the thing is when we try to suppress it it builds and it builds and it gets bigger so in order to kind of release that is actually give yourself some time to be still and to, to notice the feelings that come up but then um and I mean depending on what the setback is give yourself a a cut of time so allow yourself to grieve with whatever it might have been but then okay from this point on I'm going to allow myself today to just get it out of my system feel the feelings but tomorrow I'm going to you know, apply the tools already that I've been taught in terms of what can I learn from this or who else could help me or, you know, what can I learn from other people perhaps faced a similar setback? What what did they do? And begin to adopt that mindset because you can always do, there's always a choice. I tell children and young people, you always have a choice. You can choose a path of disempowerment and play and really step into the victim role and give up and why me and I can't do this and everybody has it easier or you can choose the path of empowerment and be like, well, great, what can I learn from this? Um, what's one thing I can do, one little thing I can do today and use that as an opportunity to learn from and just see it as this is the stepping stone I need in order to help me achieve the next level versus this is now me being a failure and adopting that mindset. And I think one thing as well that really helps me as well is looking at people or exploring people who are successful 
but exploring what setbacks and failures they've had. Because, and this is what I tell a lot of young people, you know, the successes that you see someone achieve today was not given to them. That was achieved out of so many failures and setbacks and hugging the radiator, crying and thinking, I'm never going to make this, you know, those sort of moments. It wasn't achieved by consistent successes. It absolutely wasn't. I mean, and I think there is that cheesy saying that somebody once told me, but every no is one closer to a yes. So every setback is one step closer to what you want to achieve. And I think always taking it from that mindset to give you back that that feeling of empowerment goes a long way. What kind of setbacks have you experienced? Oh, gosh, many. Um, <laughs> so it's really interesting. I um, So all through school, I was like, you're... I mean, highly academic and definitely attached my self-worth to my grades, thinking, right, I've got to get the A's and that means I'm a good person, that means I'm a good student. And I definitely, I think, struggled with that hangover of things need to be really good and that means that I'm good. Whereas actually, I wish now that I had, you know, like in a sense, I think not being that, that achiever gives you so many skills to deal with life. Because once you leave school, nobody cares how many A's you got. Do you know what I mean? Nobody are, you know, it, it, you know it, it's important to a point to get into university and schools and things like that. But when you're running your own business or in a job 15 years down the line, nobody is going to ask about that. But I think, um, so I think initially coming out of that, and then I just, so I grew up in South Africa and I um, trained as a teacher and had a back and also trained um, in psychology, so did my psychology degree up to my honours. And then I came to the UK thinking I would come and teach for two years. And that was a massive I wouldn't say it's a setback, but it was really starting from the bottom in terms of, because up up until that point, I'd lived at home with my parents. Um, I mean, I had jobs and things like that, so I wasn't precious, but it was a real shock to the system, moving countries and having to build yourself up from scratch. And then two years down the line from that, I wasn't in the best of relationships and um, I literally found myself with about 300 pounds in my bank account and because money was stolen from my bag and it was a summer holiday. So I wasn't teaching at that point. Um, I, I, did, I was doing supply teaching and I literally had 300 pounds in my account and I had nowhere to live. I had nowhere to stay. I didn't have a home and I had to couch surf for a good three months, which was, I was lucky enough to do it with a friend of mine who said, stay in our, you know, you can stay in our living room. But that was honestly one of my lowest lowest points indeed and I then had the choice to either go back to South Africa and I thought I'm such a failure I've not made any money because all the South Africans at that point about 12 years ago came over to the UK to make lots of money and I'm like I'm going back with nothing but I then thought you know what I'm gonna make I'm going to make this work so I went back for a month and then I got myself a job back here again and I came back and it was really difficult then because I think, yes, I was then based in um, a lovely school, wonderful staff, but it wasn't the right environment for me in terms of the pupils I was working with. Um, and that was another setback in itself mm-hmm. um, and really struggling to like find your way and where you fit in. Yeah. And then I think as well, starting your own business. So once I decided to leave teaching and start my own business, whilst there's obviously more structure in place, that thing of putting yourself out there and being rejected and people saying no and the consistent mindset battle that you're dealing with in terms of where is the money going to come from? This is going to work. And, you know, things not working out the way that you want to. So there's, yeah, there's quite a, there's a lot. (laughs) There's a lot there. Did you have any personal challenges when you were younger? So you've gone through some of the setbacks that you've had um, with how you felt about getting the right grades and education and setting up your business. Did you have any personal challenges when you were younger and living in South Africa? Oh, yeah. I think um, one of the big things was definitely, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I grew up in a lovely, you know, lovely family. I was lucky enough to have a really good education and I'm aware that there were a lot of privileges given to me, um, which I'm grateful for. But I think in terms of, challenges definitely finding your place within your peers so I'm actually quite sensitive and 
looking back now, I was a big people pleaser, wanting to conform, wanting to fit in, which I know a lot of young people feel as well. And it's part of that process of growing up and finding your tribe, things like that. And also, you know, academically comparing myself to my peers a lot, always thinking I'm not good enough, I'm not as smart as them, and trying to keep up in that way. And I think as well, in terms of just finding my place and who I was. I think I was, you know, my self-confidence, well, it just wasn't there because I was always seeking for approval and always wanting to make people happy and not wanting to upset anybody. I think that a large part of my teens was was mindset consumed about what are, what are other people thinking of me, what are their opinions of me, and kind of getting lost in the worry when it comes to that. And I think as well, I mean, we didn't have the... The, the, the pressure of social media to that extent at that age but that, that, that we do today. But something else that was also really in the forefront of my mind from a young girl, I think from about 11 even, or even younger than that, was not being happy in my body, which I think a lot of, you know, young, you know, girls and boys can relate. And I know we talk a lot about it now, but it was something that I really did did struggle with it always trying out different diets and doing different things and um not, not having at all a level of acceptance and could and honestly yeah I remember spending so much time consumed with those sort of unhelpful negative thoughts you know self being self-critical definitely not my own best friend <laughs> <laughs> and how would you if you're working with someone now who was going through a similar experience that you had what what tools would you want to share with them? What would you go through to kind of change that mindset, something that's more empowering? Yeah, I think, well, it goes back to what I said, the crux of what I do is begin to get awareness of what it is that you are thinking because nothing can change until you become aware of thoughts that you're thinking. And once you're able to become aware of that, and I'd suggest, you know, I enjoy journaling. So journal some of the negative stories that you're telling yourself and even go as deep to think, well, where does the story come from? Who does it belong to? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we're talking about working with teenagers now, I wouldn't do this with a five-year-old because that's a little bit too in-depth. But, um, you know, who does the story belong to or where does it belong to in my life? Does it, does, is this still the same story I'm telling myself because I couldn't, you know, solve my math problems in year two? And I've kind of carried that story with me that I'm stupid, that I'm not smart, that I'm not good with, not, you know, whatever it might be. But um, then looking at asking yourself these, you know, starting to change that story. What is the story that I do want to be telling myself? And also a great kind of reframe in terms of the question is what would I be telling my friend if they felt like this? Generally, we tend to use that voice of encouragement with our other people that we love, but we don't use that voice with ourselves. So beginning to make it a daily practice of using that kinder, more compassionate voice with ourselves and treating ourselves, I know it sounds so cheesy because we hear it a lot, but treating yourself like you would your own best friend. And in terms of yeah you know self-talk is a big thing and I think as well in terms of recognizing those unhelpful feelings that we feel if something has happened that causes the frustration the jealousy the whatever it might be acknowledge it and know that it's okay but uh, you know and, and sit with it really is the other thing as well because th- there was research done recently and I forgot the name of the 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 researcher but they found that that an emotion sits within your body for up to about three to seven minutes but then what carries on after that is all because of the thoughts that we're getting the attention that we're giving it but energetically the body comes you know the emotion comes in it kind of escalates and then it fizzles back like it, it, it moves its way out of our body again but why it sticks around for so much longer is because of the energy that we're giving it. So I think being brave to sit with some of those uncomfortable feelings, because when I work with young people, there's a lot of resistance against these feelings and just actually allowing yourself to sit allows them to dissolve that a little bit quicker. You recently launched your power cards, which are positive affirmations and they're vibrant and yeah crisp and clean and I I love them can a a teenage girl use them I think they're aimed for children but can anyone have them do you know what do you know what when we designed them so myself and Nicola who is um 
from a life more inspired that works with women. She's got her own range of cars that are obviously designed for for women and especially women entrepreneurs. And um, we wanted to create something for children. And obviously, predominantly, most of my work is seen in primary schools. And that's purely just because I'm a primary teacher so I kind of tapped into the network that I had um, but I do work with a lot of teens and you know do, do sessions in, in secondary schools if I'm approached but um, absolutely I would say the cards are used because I use the cards and the reason and I'm not just saying this because we I've designed them but they're a really easy way to get to the point of things like they've been broken down into simple like it's just easily digestible so it's okay to get things wrong like oh yeah it's okay to get things wrong do you know what I mean or um today I will be my own best friend it's like yeah actually let's be your own best friend today you know yeah do you know what I mean I think absolutely you could you know you could use them I mean another one that we've got here which we've which we've taken from Marie Folio it is one that I use all the time everything is figure outable um and I'm always telling myself that especially when I've got a problem or when things are difficult and challenging I'm like well now everything is figure outable so I think 100% these things can be, you know, these cards can be used with teens as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there are obviously ways we could make them a little bit more teen friendly in terms of design, which I think is kind of maybe the next step in the books. But I love using these. And like I said, I'm in my 30s. So, <laughs> yeah, so definitely, definitely. So if you're a parent or a young girl or a teacher listening, then they need to get a few batches. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, they're really good. I think with parents, the feedback we've received so far is, you know, it's a great communication. Um, it strengthens communication between parents because it gives them the opportunity to talk about things that they might not generally talk about in every day. You know, like talking about being your own best friend or using kind words with yourself. And what does that look like? When, how can we start to use that? And, you know, in schools as well, in terms of circle time and activities and things like that. So many, many different ways that you could use them. Absolutely. And you talked um, a moment ago about going into schools and working with children and young people what do your sessions tend to be geared around when you go in yeah so I mean it's a mix so um and it's a lot of it is to do with assumptions um I've got a program but schools generally I go according to what schools want um so some schools might have me in for a whole school workshop where I work with children if we talk about primary from reception to year six and I might be based there for two days and that would also include a parent talk and a, um, a staff overview and themes would include anything from managing my big feelings or managing my big emotions um, which is where we cover the brain we uncover what happens in our brain when we feel stressed um, so when working with older children in, in in secondary schools it's more about stress management and um, dealing with and you know the anxious feelings and shifting perspective and all of that we also look at you know co- around confidence self-talk mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot in terms of self-talk and changing the negative chatter. Um, so with the little ones, again, the other theme might be mistakes are cool, but with the older ones, it's about building resiliency, the sense of bounce back ability. And yeah, really just giving them the tools at an earlier age that we never had as children growing up. And I think, I guess I'm kind of assuming from you, you know, just in terms of the podcast and what you're putting out, the, the amazing things you're putting out there in the world, but all the personal development and self-growth that, you you know, we've done, that where we've, been, where we've begun to untangle some of our negative stories or unhelpful stories and really looked at building our mindset. So giving children and young people the tools younger on so that they can actually start to develop more helpful and positive habits from a younger age versus trying to unlearn things later on in life trying to build these habits at a later stage and that really is my intention it's um it's to support definitely support their mental and emotional well-being and i think giving them yeah giving them these tools from a younger age yeah absolutely i want to ask you a series of quick fire <laughs> a trip down memory lane can you tell me um your first kiss where and when was it oh goodness yes so I think honestly I think I was about 16 um and I 
it was at home. <laughs> yeah, it was at home. Well, in South Africa. So um, it was there. Yeah. Yeah. With the boyfriend that I was with then. <laughs> Is there a song that sticks with you from growing up? Um, well, one of the songs that I really, in terms of growing up, I had a massive crush on Bon Jovi. So he was the, I mean, and I listened to his songs. I was somewhere, I can't remember where I was the other day, and they were playing his songs. And I was so weird, I could pick up all of the lyrics and all of the words. Um, I was like, this is bizarre, because I haven't sung this in years. And it's amazing how your brain still just picks it up. But like, in, inside, like, I like, knew what the words were that were coming next. But um, so definitely, I, yeah, I used to have a massive crush on him. But in terms of a song, more, I'd say, from... One that springs to mind is um, Candy by, oh gosh, who's it by? Names, uh, oh, I can't remember, but that, yeah, it's an old um, old school song called Candy. That was the one that kind of sticks, sticks to mind right now. Brilliant, thank you. And I ask all guests two final questions. Knowing what you know now and all of the skills, the amazing skills you've got that you share with young people, what would you advise your younger self if you could? I honestly, I would tell her to relax, to know that everything will be okay. I'd also tell her to trust herself because she knows a lot more than what she's giving herself credit for. Um, and because my mind naturally is of a tends to like likes to worry and obviously I use a lot of tools that I teach to kind of curb that but to be present and to yeah relax to be present enjoy the moment instead of trying to borrow drama from the future and create the worst case scenarios or try and control things too much excellent and if you could give one gift to teenage girls all over the world anything what would that be Oh, I love this. That, honestly, that you are enough. I know that sounds so basic, so simple, but if like, if I look at all of the reasons why I work with children and young people, if you, you look at like an onion and you peel the layers right at the bottom, it's the same thing of I feel that I'm not enough in whatever capacity. And to know that you don't need to do any more work, you don't need to do any work on yourself for schools, nothing is going to make you more than enough because you already are enough and having that as a sense of self like it's deep drilled down inside of you that will then come out and shine like you don't have to change anything about you and the mere fact that you are on this planet means that you've got something that you need to do because the chances of us being here is like one in 400 trillion so which we're not going to go into now but it's just that you are clearly here for a reason and you are more than enough that's fantastic. Well, thank you, Natalie. It's been brilliant speaking with you today. Thank you so much. Honestly, it's been such a joy. I've loved it. I've loved it. I'm going to write down what I would tell my younger self. I'm actually going to do that and remind myself and put that up on my walls. That was a very good, yeah, that was a really good reminder there. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to Becoming Women with me, Ella Sims. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please follow me on Twitter or Instagram or visit www.becomingwomen.com. I'd love it if you could please share this podcast with anyone you know who would enjoy listening to it. And if you are a young girl, I'd love to hear your feedback on today's episode. So feel free to send me a DM. See you next week.